But Dr. Nunley's been here several times, and he is a, a, a teacher. And uh, he is premier teacher, and he does a lot of apologetics. Tonight, you don't want to miss because significant archaeological finds in the last year are going to be revealed to you and what they mean to us, and it will boost your faith to not doubt what the book says is in living color, and you can physically touch it uh, through the archaeological finds in the land. So I'm just saying to you, don't miss tonight at 6 o'clock at 4.30. Come to the meeting. If you have any desire at all, even if you know you don't have the money, you want to know about the trip, come at 4.30. You're welcome to join us with Dr. Nunley uh, to learn about more about the trip. And uh, as he comes right now, I want you to thank him for coming. He's come, drove, drove here uh, from Springfield. He teaches, he writes, he travels, taking people all over, including ministers and Bible students, uh, from Bible colleges and trains them and teaches them and he doesn't just show sites it's a it's a bus rolling collegiate level Bible class that is amazing you won't want to miss it and it's not scary we're going to we're going to go to Petra this time pick up the schedule at the event center and you can read all about it welcome Dr. Wave Nunley my buddy bless you pastor thank you Good morning. Uh, thank you, Pastor Moonwalk. Um, <laughs> Pastor Jeff, Pastor Brett, uh, Pastor Don, thank you guys for having me. Like the old shoe, the dog keeps dragging up, but I keep coming back because this is feeling more and more like home all the time. <laughs> you guys in Iowa are awesome. And so thanks for having us again. My wife is in the back. I want to say to um, high school students, even if you're a freshman or a sophomore, you need to be thinking about uh, AP courses, you need to be thinking about dual credit classes and stuff. There is a trip that you guys are doing from New Hope. I think it comes up in uh, middle of April, April 19th. Uh, April 19th and back on April 20th. You get to miss some school, you get to eat some good food, meet some new folks, and hang out with us at Evangel. I want to talk to you. My wife wants to talk to you, and uh, we need good students. I need some good, motivated, smart students because I like teaching those kind. And if you're a dummy, you can come too, but you know, we won't <laughs> really make that, you know, broadly known. Just kind of keep the joy to ourselves. At any rate, so there is a trip that is uh, planned for you to visit Evangel University, spend the night on campus, um, have lunch and dinner with us, attend some events, go to classes, and see what college is like and see if that's not in your future. I'm trusting God that it will be and that I'll get a crack at you. Uh, I, just, I just keep coming back. Just keep coming back and keep coming back for more. So um, spend some time with us at Evangel. Um, I do welcome you on behalf of Evangel University and, uh, and uh, Assemblies of God Theological Seminary and the Center for Holy Land Studies to be involved with us uh, on a trip in February. This is a New Hope trip. This is y'all. And uh, this is, uh, we're doing this just for you. If you are sitting on the fence and you're not sure about this because of weather or finances or whatever, I want to encourage you to daydream during this message. And do not come back tonight because you will be pushed off of that fence that you're sitting on if you're sitting on the fence about. So you would not want to be um, in that undecided role, and you won't be for very long, so don't come and don't listen this morning. It's a reverse psychology, Pastor. It's about the only psychology I know. But. All right, this morning we're going to be talking to you about what can we learn from a pile of rubble from the synagogue at Magdala in the land of Israel. I don't want to take anything for granted. I remember just a few couple of years ago, we were riding down the road in Israel with a not New Hope group, another group, and one of the ladies in the back of the bus said, um, uh, Dr. Nunley, should we be looking out of the window? You guys keep talking about the Dead Sea squirrels, and I don't want to miss any of them. So, so I don't, I'm not taking anything for granted. We're going to start off with big, chip, big picture. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, this is the land of Israel looking from the south to the north. 
Here's Jerusalem down here at the bottom right there. Here's Jericho. Here's the northern end of the Dead Sea. Uh, here's the coastline, the Mediterranean coast, Haifa, Tel Aviv, uh, Jordan uh, River going up to the Sea of Galilee here. We'll look at it closer in just a moment. Continuing on north to its sources of the snows on Mount Hermon. So has everybody got their bearings more or less? We're going to be talking about a spot just on the west side of the Sea of Galilee right here. Next slide. Uh, here's a close-up. Um, sea of Galilee. And we're going to be looking at a plain on the northwestern shore. Just to get your bearings, this is the Jezreel or Armageddon Valley right here. This is the Nazareth Ridge, na so named because the main city on it is, you get 100 points right there, just right off the, right off the bat. Right, so. Um, it, gotcha. If you guys cannot see from here. All right, so Sea of Galilee here, and then the Plain of Gennesaret is what we're going to be looking at right on this northwestern shore, Nazareth Ridge right here. Next slide. I think it's the, okay, a close-up now, looking in satellite right on top of Sea of Galilee here, Sea of Galilee here, Plain of Gennesaret right there, Nazareth here, Mediterranean here. Uh, upper Jordan, Lower Jordan. Lower Jordan, Upper Jordan, plain, uh, plain of Gennesaret right there, Nazareth Ridge, Mediterranean. Both Republicans and Democrats, all right. <laughs> and then the, the Independents right there in the middle. <laughs> Love it. All right. Next slide, please. All we've done here is looked at the same slide, but with a red road that I have uh, drawn on there for you. This is the way that Jesus would get from the home where he was in Nazareth, where he was raised, down off of that ridge, through the valleys, following a cut in the earth's crust over to Capernaum. It's about a 16-20 uh, mile trip. It's, it's one that you can make in a day. But here's what's interesting. The halfway point, or just after the halfway point, about where you would stop for lunch, is a little town that is right about there. If you get off the main road, then you can have fish for lunch. St. Peter's fish. In a little town called Magdala. That's the name of the message, and that's what we're going to be focusing on this morning. Next. All right. Even closer. Uh, the Sea of Galilee, the western shore right here. Here's the capital of that district, Tiberias. And if Jesus went down, look, this is even following the main Israeli road today. And then you get off road and you cut through a, 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 a um, kind of a, a gaff in the earth's crust, a gorge. You walk straight through that and you come out onto uh, the plain of Gennesaret. And Magdala, right on, that's that little dot right there, this little yellow dot right here. You guys actually are able to see, I think, the, because of the lighting, even better. So Tiberius here, the main road going up the seacoast, and there's Magdala right there. The plain of Gennesaret right here. Next slide, please. We're going from the big down into the smaller perspective. All right, this is an oblique view, and we're, again, looking through that cut in the earth's crust to Magdala right there. There's Tiberias Sea of Galilee right here. Here's Magdala. Here's the cut in the earth's crust, and here's Tiberias. Next slide. Here's the plain of Gennesaret. Magdala right here, cut in the earth's crust. Next. Ah, aerial photography. Don't you love it? Okay, it's not going to cost you an extra shekel. All right. Uh, uh, kibbutz Arbel right here. Uh, all kinds of grain being grown here. And the main road in Jesus' day ran right through this cut in the earth's crust out onto the plain of Gennesaret right there. Sea of Galilee and Golan Heights in the background. Everybody kind of got your bearings. Capernaum is over here. Magdala is, you can't see it because of this part of the mountain, but it's right underneath, right on the seashore. Everybody good with that? Main road goes right through here in Jesus' day onto the plain of Gennesaret, 
Capernaum over here, Magdala, which is, if you could see through that mountain, you would see it right on the seashore. Next slide. All right, now we're looking from north to south. Changed our perspective because this is a part of that mountain that you were just on just a moment ago. And right here is the area of the city of Magdala. You know anybody from there? Somebody named Mary who was called the Magdalene, the one from Magdala or Migdal. Can you go backward, Tammy, just for a moment? You and I in February, uh, one slide backward, you and I in February will be standing on top of Mount Arbel, and we will be able to see all of this in 3D, high resolution, 360 surround, um, and we'll be able to open up these kinds of Bible passages and study on site because there's nothing quite like being there. If a picture paints a thousand words, being there in person paints a million words. Okay, it didn't work. We're trying up here. <laughs> Just wait till I get you at Evangel, guys. Okay, next slide, Tammy. Um, in the um, Babylonian Talmud, which is a, uh, the, some of the works of the early rabbis, the early rabbis say this, the period for fish fermentation, and they're concerned about things being coming leaven because this text is about Passover, and you're not supposed to have anything that is leavened in your home during Passover. So they want to know, how long can you keep fish? Fish. This is before refrigeration. This is before artificial preservatives. You know, those Twinkies that last forever? They'll be there when Jesus comes back. Okay, didn't have that yet. So the period for fish fermentation is as long as it takes a man to walk from Migdal Nunaya. This, this, is, the, this is the tower of the fish uh, or the fishermen. Uh, Magdala, Migdal. It's a Hebrew word that means tower, probably in this context, a lighthouse for navigation on the Sea of Galilee to bring fishermen into their port to sell their fish in the uh, marketplace at Magdala. Migdala Nunaya, the fish tower to Tiberias, is about five, uh, three-fifths of a mile, a little bit over a half a mile. Do you remember the picture we saw just a minute ago? We saw from Nazareth and Tiberias was in the background. Next, Josephus, who is a first century Jewish historian, says this in his own autobiographical work. He said, Tarakea, that's simply a Greek word for Magdala. It's the place for fish pickling or salting, is 30 furlongs or about 3.7 miles. I think that there's a problem in the textual transmission because for hundreds of years these things were written down and I think a 3 became a 13 or maybe a 30 uh, in ancient text. At any rate, Josephus and the rabbis are talking about Magdala is just, just up the road from Tiberias. Everybody knows where Tiberias was. But it was not until some uh, 2,000 years later that we actually find Magdala. It's in eight, eight, uh, 2009, eh, about uh, 10 years ago, not quite. Next, Josephus gives us an ancient video. Uh, ancient videos are in word form. You know this, don't you guys? All right, so Josephus is videoing by writing things down, and he tells us about an event that took place in A.D. 67. These are New Testament times. He is a New Testament figure, and he is a contemporary of the apostles. He's writing at the same time the New Testament is being written down, and Josephus gives us a word video of an event that happened in A.D. 67. The Romans had invaded Israel because the Jews there declared their independence from the Roman Empire they had seceded effectively. So the Romans are going to take back what they thought belonged to them. They send in their greatest general, Vespasian, and his son, Titus. Both would become Roman emperors soon uh, afterward. And they fight a pitched battle at Magdala because it was such a crucial location. And it says there, he, Josephus says, at the end of the battle, the whole lake, this is the Sea of Galilee, was red with blood and covered with corpses. Not a man escaped. During the following days, in, uh, the district reeked with a dreadful stench and presented a spectacle equally horrible. That's a pretty vivid video, isn't it? Okay? Uh, the beaches were strewn with wrecks from boats that, the, that they tried to get away, and, and the Romans had caught up with the, with the rebels, and swollen carcasses, the dead including those who fell in the previous defense of the town, and that town is Magdala, 
numbered 6,700. I was just in Belgium for a week preaching and teaching there, and one of my hosts took me to the place where the Battle of the Bulge was fought. The first battle of the bigger that took months to end, Battle of the Bulge, took place at a place called Henri Chapelle, Henry whatever Chapelle means. Uh, it's French-speaking Belgium. And there were uh, somewhere around 7,000 white crosses and stars of David of our servicemen who died protecting your and my freedom. Those corpses are there buried in the ground in order to give us the freedom to assemble and the freedom to worship the way in, in, uh, in freedom the way that we do today. I was very appreciative of that. But the number killed in that first, that initial battle that eventually claimed the lives of 180,000 men, 180,000 men, Battle of the Bulge, um, uh, about the same number that we're dealing with right here. My wife and I uh, and children had spent quite a bit of time in the South Pacific Islands. One of them is called Saipan. The Battle of Saipan took place at the end of World War II, and the goal was to conquer Saipan, take it from the, uh, from the uh, Japanese so that then they could conquer the next island, which was Tinian, from which the airplanes would take off that would drop the two bombs that ended World War II. So the Battle of Saipan was imp really important. About 6,000, 7,000 of our Marines died in the Battle of Saipan, about the same number here that we're dealing with. In ancient times, this is, an, uh, this is a catastrophic catastrophic number. This is a significant number of people who die in one battle, almost 7,000 people. So this is one of the first major pitched battles of what is called the first Jewish revolt, A.D. 66 to 70 when the temple was destroyed. Next slide. Okay, now we're going to look at the excavation of the city of Magdala. When I lived in Israel in the 1980s, they took us up on that mountain, you know, the one that you and I are going to be on in February? We showed it to you just a minute ago. Uh, then um, they had us up there as students, and they pointed down to the plain of Gennesaret, and they say, now, folks, Magdala's down there somewhere. We just don't know where. We haven't been able to find it. it the, the reality was that a stream that flowed through that crevasse, through that gorge where the road went, had changed course over the hundreds and hundreds of years and was flowing right through a town that was underwater and all of the archaeologists and geographers had concluded that can't, it can't be there because that's where the water is going. You wouldn't want to have your home and your stuff washed out into the Sea of Galilee every time it rains, so it can't be there. In point of fact, uh, the, uh, some Mexican uh, Roman Catholics bought uh, that property in 2006, and by 2009 they had gotten permits and the, move the, uh, the earth mach moving machines and their bulldozers and the like to begin clearing it off of undergrowth and that sort of thing. And as soon as they started to level the land out, the um, earth moving machines hit rock. And uh, most of you would know you've got good deep soil here in, in Iowa, right? When you hit rock in an alluvial plain, there's something going on that's unusual, it's unnatural. So they called the archaeologist in. Archaeologists began to excavate, and lo and behold, the lost city for 2,000 years of Magdala came to life in AD 2009. Now, every time that we go, regardless of whether it's a church trip or a student trip like we're getting ready to take in May and June, for your class credit, for course credit so that you can get toward graduation, um, every group we take there because it's such a significant site. Um, in fact, this building right here is a synagogue. It's one of only seven synagogues in the entire land of Israel that's been discovered that is from the first century. So Magdala, destroyed by the Romans in A.D. 70 and A.D. 67, became a time capsule. No one ever rebuilt it. They didn't uh, reconstitute the city there. And so it lay in ruins and was eventually covered up by the dirt and the stream uh, and the erosion, covered up and left for us today in almost perfect condition. So what you're looking at is a synagogue, the synagogue of Nazareth, the synagogue where Mary Magdalene would have grown up going to church, the synagogue where I think we're going to see Jesus would have eventually visited and preached in. Next slide. 
So there were some women, Jesus, uh, Luke 8 says, that had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. M one of them, Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Ladies and gentlemen, she is the hat trick of demon possession. She is the grand slam of demon possession. She is the touchdown that wins the Super Bowl of demon possession. Some of us only had one or two, right? She had all seven. She had the full house. And Jesus went out of his way to touch her right where she was. That'll speak to you today, won't it? You remember the song, he'll go through any valley, he'll go through any shadow, he'll go over any mountain, he'll run through any roadblock to pursue you, to pursue me. Praise God for that, because he's still in the business of doing that. Do you remember the little red road that I etched on that uh, satellite image connecting Nazareth to Capernaum? Well, Magdala was just a little bit off the beaten path, but Jesus was willing to take a detour to meet the need of a woman who was possessed by seven demons. I think that's pretty neat, yeah? And in reality, he doesn't take detours. He's got a laser beam right on Mary's life, right on my life, right on your life. It's the same Jesus. He's not taking a detour. It's not a waste of his time. He'll go through anything to pursue, to reach us. You are the one. I was the one that Jesus left the 90 and 9 for to come and meet us right where we had need of him. I love that about God. I love that about God the Father. I love that about God the Son. That is so neat. Next passage. The rest of the stuff that we read about Mary Magdalene, Mary from Migdal, Nunaya, is at the end of the Gospels. Look at, look at this passage, Matthew 27. This is passion narrative stuff. This is Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ territory that we're in now. This is Jesus crucified. Look, it says, many of the women that were looking on from a distance had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom was Mary from Migdal, Mary from Magdala, Mary from Migdal Nunaya, this fishing village that Jesus veered off of the beaten path and took a, and, and took a, a, a detour to reach out and touch this one Mary from Migdal, who was possessed of seven demons. And where his own disciples wouldn't follow Jesus all the way to the cross, look at who is standing there watching him as he died for her. Yes? He's not just an exorcist, he's also the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world, including yours, including mine, including Mary from Migdal. That is the Jesus that we're dealing with this morning, along with Mary, the mother of James, and Joseph, the mother of the sons of James and John. But James wasn't there. Matthew wasn't there. Thomas wasn't there. Peter wasn't there. These guys were all in hiding, but there was Mary. Because he who, she who is forgiven much loves much. Watch the same Mary. Next slide. Joseph, this is of Arimathea, took the body and wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb. And there was Mary sitting there as Jesus was being buried. This is not just Mary from Magdal, from Migdala, who had seven demons cast out of her, but this is also Mary who followed Jesus all the way to the cross. This is the Mary now who's followed Jesus' dead body all the way to its interment. Jesus who is being buried now, Mary is sitting outside the grave watching this burial process. Watch Mary next. At, after he had risen early on the first day of the week, this is Mark's version, he appeared first to Mary. Is there any surprise? She'd followed him from the Sea of Galilee. She watched him as he died on the cross. She would not give up following him until she saw her master buried. And now she is the first one to receive a resurrection appearance from, uh, by Jesus. This one who was rescued from demon possession seven times over is the first to see the resurrected Jesus of Nazareth. Isn't that neat? Next passage. In Matthew chapter 28, look at this. 
She came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. She's the first to touch the resurrected Jesus, and she's the first to worship the resurrected Jesus. Again, she who has forgiven much loves much. Isn't that neat? Isn't that awesome? Are you sitting in that same synagogue this morning? Do you sit in the same seat as Mary? You who have been forgiven much, do you love much? Will you follow all the way to cross and death, all the way to burial, all the way to resurrection? Absolutely, that's the commitment we've made to this one who held nothing back for us and pursued us even when we were enslaved to, you know what my worst enslavement was? Yeah, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. I grew up in the Woodstock. I grew up in the uh, Vietnam protest era. But Jesus saved me more from me than he did from anything that the 60s or 70s could throw at me. He saved me from enslavement to serving myself. Yeah? Did he rescue you from that as well? Next. John says... As, he, as she was walking away from the tomb, Jesus said to her, Mary, this is the Mary that you're studying right now in front of God and everybody at New Hope in second service. This is Mary from Migdal, Mary out of whom Jesus had cast seven demons, Mary who had been delivered not just from the enemy but from, her, from enslavement to herself that had followed him all the way through to the cross and to burial and now to resurrection, and he calls her by name, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, my master, my Lord, my teacher. Jesus had for her become her all in all. He was worth everything, and everything else in the world was worth nothing. And she was pursuing him even to resurrection, and now Jesus has to say, stop holding on to me, Mary. He has to tell her, give me some room, give me some space. I got stuff to do. My, t my clock is ticking. I've got 40 days, and then I ascend to my father. Are you still clinging? She was still clinging. He had to say, just back off a little bit, Mary. I've got other fish to fry. No pun intended, just maybe just a little pun intended. Next text. Matthew 4 says, Jesus was going about in all of Galilee, preaching and teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the kingdom, healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Now, this text is telling us that Jesus went throughout all of Galilee, and he preached in all of those villages, teaching in their synagogues. Let's take a look at one. Oh, goodness gracious, sorry about the shock to your system. This is my friend Rabbi Marv Wilson, and I not meaning to take his name in vain, but I'm going to use Marv to enter it. A fellow New Hoper, right? Uh, he's you're kind of a homeboy, and you can trust him. He's introducing you to the synagogue at Nazareth. This is one of the two main entrances. There's another one on this side right here. So the archaeologist uncovered this first century B.C., first century A.D. synagogue, and Marv is standing in the front door of it. Who else do you suppose went through this? If Jesus went through all of Galilee, preaching in all of their synagogues, who else would have walked through this door? Jesus, yes. Now, one of the benefits of, seeing, of going to Israel is seeing beautiful scenery and eating some unbelievable Mediterranean food, right? And getting to hang out with Pastor Moonwalk, or Michael, J I mean, um, Pastor Weaver. Um, and and also being afflicted by me for a couple of weeks, every day, all day long, sight after sight after sight. But one of the neat benefits is, and people say this all the time, I've always wanted to walk where Jesus walked. That's you too, right, I'm sure. Okay, well, here's the neat thing. 
When you walk where Jesus walked in these contexts and you see the Word of God in its power and in its clarity and its transformational uh, ability, what you do is you come back not just walking where Jesus walked, you're walking even more like Jesus walked. That's one of my major goals. I want to see people walk like Jesus walked. In 1 John chapter 2, it says, those who abide in Him should walk even as He walked. That's the ultimate goal, is that God get inside of us with his, the power of His Word and the working of His Spirit and transform us until we not really are that much us anymore. We're more Him, more like Him. Thank you, Marv. Next. In the New Testament, it says in Matthew 15 only. When you're reading the King James Bible, because the King James was reflecting a number of ancient manuscripts that read, he sent the multitude away, he took a ship, and he came to Magdala. So at least according to a bunch of New Testament, ancient New Testament copies, we have Jesus taking an intentional trip by boat to the port of and the city of Migdal or Magdala. Next text. And here we have that synagogue from up above. Um, I want to focus a little bit on the internal part because this is, to me, this is for the, of the seven first century synagogues that we have in the land of Israel, we, we only have one that has this internal set of seats. See these seats, benches that go all the way around the edges? That's typical of a synagogue from the first century B.C. all the way out to the first, fifth century A.D. You sit around the edges of the wall. It's not like basilica style, you know, where you have rows of benches or rows of chairs, for us rows of pews. First century synagogues all the way to fifth century, they sat around the outer wall. But this is interesting to me because it's the only synagogue that's been found that I'm aware of that has this set of internal seats. And these are closest to the, the center, the middle. This is where all the focus was. It wasn't on up here at the front. It was everybody's looking at each other, and everybody's paying close attention to what's going on right around here. This is where the Word of God was read. This is where prayer was led from. This is where people interpreted and applied the Scriptures to people's everyday lives. And so the people then that would sit closest here that had sort of the box seats is there a passage in the New Testament that says anything about this? Jesus just kind of, in passing, makes reference to a group of leaders who, who, who preached but didn't practice. He called them hypocrites, and that's still the way it is today. A hypocrite's not somebody held to a higher, that holds themselves to a higher standard. A, a hypocrite is one who says one thing and does another, yeah? And so he's speaking of these people. Next slide, please. He's speaking of these people. He, they love the place of honor at the banquets, and then you get this beautiful Hebraic poetic parallelism. He loved, they love the place of honor at the banquets and the chief seats in the synagogue. And probably on my 15th or 20th visit to Migdal, Magdala, I was looking at that and I was marveling at this unique kind of seating set up that I haven't seen in other synagogues and it came to me in a sort of in a flash. I know it takes a while for things to dawn on me. Only my 15th or 20th visit. And this has got to be what Jesus is referring to as the chief seats of the synagogue, the ones closest to that focal point where the, the Word of God was read and commented on and then applied to everyday lives. They heard the Word of God but they weren't really listening with ears to hear. They heard the Word of God, but they weren't living according to the Word of God. That's exactly the issue that he's addressing. You like to get right up close. You like to be seen in the front seats. You like the box seats. You like those places at the stadium that have the plate glass windows and have the food catered in, you know, and all of that, air-conditioned boxes, and, but, but you're not really living that life. That's exactly what Jesus is referring to, the place of honor, the place closest to the host, the place closest to the food or whatever, and the chief seats in the synagogues. And this has got to be what Jesus is referring to. We now have in stone, written in stone, what Jesus said by word of mouth when he taught. We understand now, I think, exactly what Jesus is referring to. Next text or slide. 
All right, this is a broader picture of the synagogue as a whole. You went past Marv, who greeted you at the door. Good morning. It's great to have you in God's house today. And then you walked into here, and the first place that you come to is a study room. Uh, By the way, church should be a place of study, yes? Where the Word of God is carefully considered, a place of study. Then you go into the place where prayer and and, uh, the reading of Scripture and worship and the like takes place. Okay, this larger. Now we go into, and you see how the roof would be supported by internal capitals, pillars. And then you see this location uh, right here, the, the chief seats, the regular seats, and then this kind of centerpiece. Next, from the, from the air, uh, the entryway, okay, the, uh, the um, internal part with the chief seats, Uh, This area right here, which is the place of study, continue. Uh, And now you ask, but first century, how do you you know that it was first century? Or here are just a few things. This is kind of stuff that we bring up at Evangel University, the Center for Holy Land Studies, when we're taking these study trips. This is first century BC, first century AD plaster. It's called fresco plaster, and it's, it's made in a unique kind of way, like we have wallpaper today. The plasterers would put the plaster on the wall, and before it dried, the artisans would come in and would some kind of way paint the plaster while it was still wet, so that then when the plaster set up and dried, the paint is actually embedded in the plaster. It's called fresco. And this kind of decoration like this is known from many places that were built by Herod the Great in the first century BC. Remember the Herod that killed the babies in Bethlehem and the like? Okay, first century B.C., Herod died in the spring of 4 B.C. You see this at, um, at the Herodian, you see it at Jericho, you see it at Masada, all of those places, by the way, we visit, and you see first century B.C. plaster on the walls. Automatically, you know that you're in a Herodian period building when you have stuff decorated like Herod decorated his palaces. Next. We, also, we have the plaster in a number of locations. Next. We also have it in terms of coins. These are small coins like this. Remember the widow's mite? Yeah? All right. Well, this is an interesting coin because if you can read Greek or or, uh, Latin, T-I-B-E-R-I-U-S, Tiberius, who is the Caesar in the first century at the time of the Gospels. And then you have even more specifically H-E-R-O-D-O-S, Herodos. And then it says Tetrarch the Tetrarch, Herod the Tetrarch. This is from the, the, the uh, late 20s, early 30s AD. This coin was found under the, uh, the floor of this synagogue that we're studying today. Again, evidence of first century use. Then Magdala was destroyed in AD 67 in the battle we read about in that first century historian Josephus, yes? And it then became a time capsule, sealed in time until excavators fully excavated this, and it's there for your viewing at any time from 2009 all the way until you'll see it this coming February. Looking forward, aren't you? Yeah. So we'll see you there. Those who aren't able to come, you'll get the postcard. Wish you were here. Yeah. (laughs) Another indicator of first century. This is first century style mosaic floor. All these are little tiny pieces of rock called tessera. They're cut into squares and you get differently colored rock and then you are able to make geometric designs just by changing the color of rock that you're embedding into the uh, cement of the floor. So in the first century, Jews, when they decorated their buildings, would not make any kind of an image of a human being, of a plant or an animal. You know why, right? The Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, don't make any image of anything above, on, or below the earth. So in later centuries, the time of the Christianized Roman Empire from 325 onward, then synagogues began to uh, decorate with uh, with pictures of human beings, plants, and animals. But first century, the days of Herod the Great, uh, you have only geometric designs. Check out some more. More there at the backside of the synagogue. Again, here are your chief seats. If 
you're wondering what kind of context am I in. Uh, here are your pillars that hold up the, uh, the roof, and then there's that focal point, and that's the thing that I would like to study next. Okay? In the middle, pointed toward Jerusalem, we're looking south in this direction, pointed toward Jerusalem in this direction, um, is a big block of limestone that has been worked by master craftsmen. Take a closer look. Uh, when you see this coming out of the ground for the first time, notice that the dirt still encrusted the bottom. There are four legs, and there's even horns on the, of the altar on the top, and you can see some interesting uh, inlay here by the uh, craftsman, and this lady is actually cleaning it with a brush, okay? And no big pickaxes or anything like we're down to, to brushes and things that the dentist work on your teeth with at this point. This, nothing like this had ever been found and never has been since then uh, in the intervening 10 years found in the land of Israel. This is unique to this synagogue at Magdala, pointed toward the south, pointed toward Jerusalem and toward the temple. Then, next slide, we get um, this interest, and it's also beveled like this. It's like this pulpit that if you lay a book down on it, it's not square, it's not flat like this. It's, it's sloped. Do you see this? And do you see the, the four, you know, at least you can see two of the legs? Okay, an, a, a close-up. Next. Um, again, here's the, the original floor that was plastered and then mosaic floor at one point, but then you have this beautiful piece that had, the likes of which had never been seen by archaeologists. Most people in the United States have never seen this. Urbandale special. <laughs> Next. Next. Okay. Give me one more. Okay, now we're looking at the backside. It, it, the, the tilt of, of this rock is toward you. So you would be standing behind this. What's the first thing you see? You see the menorah, right? Representing the presence of God, the seven-branched lampstand that has been over the centuries the main symbol of Judaism. You see that the menorah is behind the table of showbread or the bread of the presence. You, you see on each side two flagons that were, some of them were silver, some of them were gold, but they were used for pouring libation offerings out onto the altar in the temple in Jerusalem. Water, wine, and oil. You see on either side, you can you see columns with capitals at the top. These are the columns that are mentioned in the book of Kings. When Solomon built the temple, he had two major columns out front that you saw first. They were even given names, Yahin and Boaz, and uh, they're represented right here. This is situated, pointing toward Jerusalem, and its, its artistry is representing the realities of temple, of presence of God. Take a look at another um, uh, slide. Now you can see the side, and it is dressed with these columns that surrounded the court of the Gentiles. Part of that was, uh, colonnaded uh, area is, a, is an area that's called Solomon's Porch or Portico, where Jesus preached and taught and healed, where later in the book of Acts, the apostles would do the same thing in the same place in Acts 5. Um, you also see an oil lamp. It's an interestingly shaped oil lamp. It comes from the days of Herod the Great. It was popularized then. And pilgrims from Galilee, places like Nazareth, we're told in Luke chapter 2 that Jesus, Joseph, and Mary went to, uh, on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Remember when he was left in the temple? Left behind? Okay. And people would go from Nazareth to Jerusalem, and as a memento, uh, as a uh, sort of a souvenir, they bought and brought back these lamps that were made in and around the temple um, as reminders of their pilgrimage to the holy city, as a reminder that they had been in the presence of God. So again, this rock is representing the presence of God with his people. Next. Okay. Uh, on the back side, or actually the front, the one closest to Jerusalem, you have these um, interesting figures here. These are probably the wheel within the wheel that represents the glory of God in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 1 and 11. Um, again, representations of God's dwelling presence in His temple in the holy city. Next. All right. Um, 
Another picture of the same. Uh, notice the four, uh, the four horned corners of the altar. That's where sacrifice would be offered up. And this uh, is where God's word and the reading of it and the study of it is being offered up as sacrifice. Notice the four uh, legs. Uh, they were probably either made of uh, uh, of stone or possibly of wood, and then the wood deteriorated over two millennia of time. What you're looking at is the top of a pulpit, the top of a lectern, uh, the, the top of a, uh, of a piece of furniture where scrolls would be rolled out and read to the congregation so that they could hear the Word of God. Next. Again. And again. In the Gospel of Luke, we're given another word video. Again, they didn't have microchips and all kinds of cool stuff like we have today, so their videos were in words. And this video is, this is the typical sermon that Jesus would preach when he went to a synagogue. At this particular point, he was in Nazareth, uh, where he was brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read. You, know, you stand, you sit to listen, you stand up to read. Okay, and so when Jesus stands up to read, what's the next part of the video? Next slide. The book of, that's actually the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened, he unrolled the scroll is a better contextualized translation. And he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to proclaim release to the captives, how do you suppose Mary would have read that, would have understood that? I need release. I'm a captive. I'm a candidate for that right now. Proclaim release of the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set free those who are downtrodden. Next slide. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he, again a better translation, unrolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. And here's Jesus' shortest sermon. But you wish this one was that short. He said, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I'm the fulfillment of that pro prophecy of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is on me and I have come here to your town to your synagogue. I've gotten up into your Kool-Aid, into your grill, and I am proclaiming release to you, Mary Magdalene, to anyone else from the city of Migdal, to everybody in the whole world, because we just read the passage, Jesus is proclaiming that he is the source of release. He's the source of provision if you're the poor. He is the source of encouragement if you're discouraged. This Jesus that took a detour off the main road is still doing that. He's still coming into the synagogue at Magdala. You doing the math here? He's still coming into the lives of Migdalites or of Urbandaleites, and he's still proclaiming release to you because see, this Jesus that we're talking about here is the same yesterday. Come on. <laughs> yesterday. Finish it for me. Yesterday, today, and forever. He's Yahweh. He doesn't change. The grass withers and the flower fades, but God's Word stays the same forever. So this Jesus that we're hearing about here is not a Jesus, you may have noticed, that is a Jesus of myth and legend and once upon a time and they all lived happily ever after and just good bedtime stories. This is a real up-in-your-face Jesus whose words and whose life have been confirmed over and over and over again. Even this obscure person who's only basically mentioned in, at the end of Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection, this Mary from Migdal has come to life. But the God of Mary of Migdal, the master of Mary of Migdal, not just Mary, but the master of Mary has come to life, and we've seen him in a way like we've never seen him before. He is a Jesus who's involved. He's a Jesus who is willing to take a detour, because it's not really a detour at all. The whole point of the one missing sheep, he's willing to leave everyone behind to find you. He's willing to meet you, like Mary, right where you are. If you can click and drag all of that right over into your life, he wants to meet your need, whatever that is. 
He wants to meet the need of family members that may not even be here, who's right, they're etched in your mind because they have such pressing issues. Maybe it's a friend, a neighbor, or a coworker. He's, he's here for that. That's the kind of Jesus he is. That's the way he rolls. That's been the way he's acted toward people since he created them. So he's not going to change now. Would you stand with me? Next slide, please. We're wanting to encourage you, of course, to be a part of this trip, no doubt about it. But meeting Jesus, more importantly, allowing Jesus to meet you where you are right now, that's the most important thing in the world. It's the whole reason that I'm here. It's the reason your pastors brought me here. It's the reason my wife and my granddaughter took time out of their schedules to drive me up here. This Jesus is not make-believe. He is not a pretend Jesus. He's a God whose life is still etched in stone, and he's a God who wants to walk right into your life right now. Pastor Weaver, can you help me uh, conclude here? He wants to meet whatever situation is going on right now with you. He proclaims release to the captives. Let's pray. Father, it's in Jesus' name that we want to look to you right now, and we are looking to you to walk into our lives in power and in authority in a major way. We're recognizing that you are big and you are real and you're out of the box and you still walk into our synagogues and meet us right where we are. Re irrespective of what the bondage is, irrespective of what the habit is, regardless of what the need is, we know that you're sufficient to meet it. If you can cast out seven demons out of Mary from Migdal, you can walk into our lives and you can touch us at that point of our deepest need and you can revolutionize our lives. And Lord, it's like the, it, our response will be the same as that of Mary of Migdal. We submit to you. We kneel before you. We worship you. And we grab on to your feet and we say, Rabboni, my master, my Lord, the one to whom I look. And we give you thanks, Lord, that you're able to perform all of that in the mighty name of Jesus of Nazareth. God's people said, amen.